In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. We have gathered this evening and we have heard the stories of our spiritual beginnings. These have great meaning for us as the people of God. They are the very deep of God reaching down in and touching the deep within each of us. And this is what we crave, for God to cut through all of the clatter and clutter of our lives. We crave to be truly God's and for God to be truly ours. We began by intoning the old words of the exultant, joining in the ancient ways. We are rejoining the past to the present. We remember the body of Christ and our part in it. We wake up. We come to ourselves and we begin to apprehend the dents and bruises of our lives, all because we have forgotten to whom we belong. We have forgotten who we are and who is important. This evening has the power to bring us back into the fold, to give up wishing for the cure li curated lives we see and project ourselves, to push the reset button on our existence, to turn away from dead idols, cruel fantasies, and false dreams that actually that actually mar us and carry us far away from our true destination, the place where we ourselves say we desire but cannot find by ourselves. The vigil is this holy intervention that gives us all the means to turn our backs on these fabricated gods so that we can tend to the calling that we sometimes ignore, but to which we are always invited. This is why we gather this evening. The vigil is all about bringing ourselves, our souls, and bodies to this house of God, each with our own prayers for our lives, our families, our livelihoods. And it is here where we start again through the hope and promise of the resurrection. Now, this is no easy task, to be sure. We see in the scriptures that forgetting ourselves comes with being human, and with forgetting comes trouble. In each of our stories this evening, we hear of situations that humans find themselves in that veil the mighty power of God in their lives. Now, the power is always present, but in each of the readings, humanity required an intervention that cleared all the sin, all of the miscues, all of the clutter we manufacture ourselves and seem to hoard as we receive it from others. Things done and left undone that keep us from our true bond with the Lord. There's no better example of this than Abraham. Abraham, from our first reading, was blessed. Outwardly, he has it all. And yet this very strangeness of that story hints that this is not true at all. There is trouble that remains until Abraham is forced to choose God and to set God first and above all 
in his life, over all things in his life, and certainly over the one thing that he valued most. He has this titanic internal brawl that takes place right in front of our eyes, and we watch spellbound because we know what that is like. Moses has his own struggles as he finally experiences how damaging bondage is to the human psyche and how costly, how very costly and complicated the agonizing work of God actually is to bring freedom from bondage, freedom from slavery. The prophet Ezekiel looked upon a valley full of bones, the husks of humanity, unnumbered with God, and God dares him to speak, dares him to say that there is no hope, no power in the Almighty. In each instance, even the faithful were challenged challenged to face reality, to remember the cosmic order, and then be invited into a more perfect union with the great I am. But this is just the beginning. Our journey this evening includes our gospel, and the story continues after a shocking week for Jesus, even as the Son of God. The visit by Mary Magdalene and the other Mary began with such a world-weary sigh. I can picture in my mind the two meeting outside the place they were staying that morning and then trudging towards that garden tomb, hoping to tend to their Lord. But friends, death does not have the final word. God reached down on Easter and acted in the most unimaginable way, in a way that was so bombastic as to snap us out of our day-to-day with the resurrection, the disciples dared to believe that Jesus was actually the way, the truth, the life. And now there was true reconciliation with the Father. Death was destroyed, and their Lord was alive. The good news of Easter is that through Christ we are forgiven and no stone on some tomb. Not even death can stand in the way of our Lord's power and love for the people. This is the good news, but it is also the secret to life. Yes, we will have ups and downs, major ones at that. We all know this. We will have events happen to us or do things ourselves that cause us to stray from God. But now, this evening, there is such power in joining together and remembering what Christ has done for us. This is the reset and the joy. And friends, we don't have to wait for Easter to receive it. Take heed of our ancient histories. We needn't find trouble by forgetting who we are and what we are called to do in the world. Don't miss the meaning of our gathering. Hear the word anew. Hear our sacred call again. The Lord invites us to turn outward, to go forth this evening with fresh eyes, with renewed strength, 
to meet the challenges of faith, of forgiving, of serving, of helping others rediscover the Easter that is available to them also. This is no heavy load. In fact, we were actually designed for this. This is our birthright, to reach others. And friends, this is our adventure as the people of St. Michael, to turn outward, to offer Easter as it has been offered to us. Amen.